Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the US dollar Chinese yuan cross. And uh, you can see here, I've drawn in the major trend. Uh, we have had some sideways action in the last couple of years. Uh, but generally, overall, the trend is down in the value of the dollar versus the Chinese currency. Um, you can see it's lost about a quarter of its value since 2006, 2007. Now, the re uh, one more thing here. Um, a lot of people believe that the Chinese currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar. It's not. It's, it's pegged within a band which means that it can trade within a range. I don't know what the band is. I don't think it's this wide, but it can trade within a range. And uh, obviously you can see by the recent market action that it's n nowhere pushing that band. If it were pushing the band and the band had to be expanded, it would look something like that. It would hit a flat bottom and then as they expanded the band and it would go and, and catch up to it. Um, so it's trading in free market, uh, at the rate that it's at, it's not pushing either direction on the band. The reason why I bring this up is because I want to talk about this recent story about China and joining the IMF's SDR basket. Now, as it stands, the SDR is pretty much irrelevant in world trade. I think it still only counts for 2.5% of foreign exchange reserves. I don't, I don't think that it is really relevant, but the story is relevant because the spin is that China, you know, is wanting to get into the SDR and it's being turned down. I don't know if that's the truth. And that's what I'm trying to figure out here. But uh, looking at the figures, we're going to dig into the figures. It seems to me that it's probably not the case. So let's read this story. China is taking steps to improve the liquidity and transferability of its currency sometimes even at the cost of short-term harm to the economy to help its currency to join a key reserve currency basket designed by the International Monetary Fund. But by and large, chances are Beijing would get disappointed this year. Now, I believe it's only reviewed once every five years, so that would be 2020 if it would be reviewed again. I don't know. Maybe they'll change that rule. But by and large, chances are Beijing will get disappointed this year. Colin Moore, chief Global Investment Officer of Columbia Threadneedle Investments sees Beijing unable to meet the criteria for inclusion in the so-called special drawing rights basket for now, and it hopes to pass the review due by the year end is quite slim. Given the importance of China in global trading, it is reasonable for the IMF Executive Board to consider the currency for inclusion in the basket of currencies used to value the SDR but it's not clear to me that they're currently meet the criteria for inclusion in the SDR. The executive board at the IMF can make sure the SDR decision, can make the SDR decision with only 70% of the vote, giving hope for China since the US only has 17% of the voting rights, but more pointed out that inclusion in the SDR will require 85% of members in the IMF, and therefore the US and Europe still have a lot of bargaining power in the whole review. Well, just add up the numbers there. If it requires 85% of members and the U.S. has 17%, then obviously the U.S. has a unilateral veto. If every other member voted yes and the U.S. voted no, it's a no. Uh, now we're going to get to this balancing when we look at how unbalanced the representation is on the IMF. And I think that's probably the reason why China and the rest of the BRICS are going to be doing an end run around this thing because it's rigged. But we're going to see how rigged it is when we dig in deeper here. Moreover, another more important question is whether China's market reforms have prepared the currency so it can be widely used in global transactions and become freely exchangeable or as described by the IMF, freely usable. To more, the answer in the near term is no. I would welcome rather than fear those reforms, but we appear to be a long way from there, said Moore. If the Chinese government takes more substantial steps toward making the yuan fully exchangeable rather than just widening the permitted exchange rate bands, allows interest rates to be set by the market, and allows free movement of capital, then we should assume the currency may evolve toward full reserve status over medium to long term, he said. Now that's really ironic considering that one of the criteria is that they allow interest rates to be set by the market. 
Well, who doesn't allow the, the, the interest rate to be set by the market? That would be the United States, Japan, and the European Union. And we're going to see here, they're the dominant players in this SDR. So that is a ridiculous criterion that none of the members, the major members in the SDR abide by. Uh, allow free movement of capital. Well, we do, but the United States is actually going in the opposite direction uh, toward more and more restriction on the movement of capital. The IMF is keen to bring in emerging market currencies in order to boost the usage of the SDRs, which account for less than, there's a number I said two and a half, it's 4% of global reserves and carries little function in the global financial system at this time. To boost usage of the SDRs, IMF will need a currency that is freely accessible in any and all urgent circumstances. Last but not least, even under a scenario where China gets into the SDR basket, it doesn't mean that the currency will post a meaningful threat to the U.S. dollar's position in the global financial market. By no means can it be called a reserve currency after joining the basket, according to Moore. The use of the word reserve here is confusing. The SDRs are supplementary foreign exchange reserves, but must not be confused with the common use of reserve currency, Moore said. A true reserve currency, such as U.S. dollar or euro, is freely exchangeable and can be used in multiple transactions. SDRs can only be held by central banks not private corporations or individuals, and can only be exchanged by the IMF's SDR department or on a voluntary basis with IMF, IMF member countries. So uh, they're dissing China, but the IMF is even worse. So let's look at some of the numbers here because these are what is really fascinating, and this will show you how completely out of date, obsolete, um, just a joke the IMF is. So this is the Wikipedia entry for the IMF, and uh, it goes into all of that. The thing I want to concentrate here on is the voting power. Voting power in the IMF is based on a quota system. Each member has a number of basic votes. Each member's number of basic votes equals 5% of the total votes, plus one additional vote for each special drawing right of 100,000 of member countries quota. The special drawing right is a unit of account of the IMF and represents a claim to currency. It's a based on a basket of key international currencies. The basic vote generate a slight bias in favor of small countries, but the additional votes determined by SDR outweigh the bias. The table below shows quota and voting shares for IMF members. Now, Another thing I researched was where the IMF gets their money, and that's going to be very interesting because um, that's roughly the same as this voting representation. Uh, I don't have that chart in front of me, and there really isn't a recent one. The newest one I could find was from 2010, but it roughly matched these. Now let's look at this breakdown here. This is the voting power of the various countries. You can see the United States has 16.5% of the votes, followed by Japan at 6.23% of the vote, Germany with 5.81%. Interesting that they don't break this down into EU. Uh, then France with 4.29%, United Kingdom with 4.29%, here's China with 3.81%, then Italy, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Russia, India. Netherlands, Belgium, Brazil. So keep that in mind. Uh, here's your first world nations and then your bricks are down here. Now, let's look briefly here at the SDR valuation because that's a lot tighter than the breakdown of countries. Uh, really the only participants in it are the Euro, the Japanese Yen, the Pound Sterling and the US Dollar. And uh, you can see the US dollar equivalent um, number. That's gonna be the main number you wanna look at. You can see the Euro has 0.46, while the US dollar has 0.66. The pound sterling has 0.17, and the Japanese yen has 0.09. So the US dollar and the Euro put together make up about 80 plus percent of the SDR, um, very, very skewed, very, very biased. Now this last column is the percentage change. You can see that uh, 
Japan is actually falling, falling. the euro has increased, and uh, the US dollar is staying the same. Now you can go and pick any year that you want here. Um, you can even pick, you know, in the 90s uh, when there was, uh, oh, it's not gonna let me do that. But uh, I did pull up one in the 90s where it actually showed me, uh, here we go, you have Deutsche Mark and uh, French franc and a Japanese yen pound sterling and US dollar. So back then you can see that the Japanese yen was almost half of the of the value of the US dollar in uh, the SDR basket. Um, and then the French franc was almost as high as the Japanese yen with the Deutsche Mark up there. So that's very interesting. Now, what I really wanted to concentrate on is the GDP analysis. This this chart here is GDP in purchasing power parity. That's gonna be the most important GDP figure because we can't look at GDP based on the local currency because obviously everybody has a different currency. And to, to zero out inflation and other factors, we just use purchasing power parity. Now you can see here in this chart, the order of gross domestic product. We've got China on top with the United States right behind. Interestingly enough, we've got India in third place, almost twice as big as Japan. We've got Russia in fifth place. So Germany's in sixth place. Now, how many people would tell you that, uh, or would be common knowledge that Russia has a greater GDP than Germany? Not too many people. There's Brazil right there in seventh place. Here's Indonesia in eighth place, which doesn't come in in any of these uh, IMF lists, hardly anywhere. Here's France. Here's the UK all the way down at 10th. So let's just do some quick math here and add them up here. We've got 18 for China. India gets us to 25. Add in Russia, we get to roughly 29. Add in Brazil, and uh, we're at 32. So the four main of the BRICs give a total of 32, whereas the United States at 17 and a half with Japan uh, is uh, 22, and uh, Germany is uh, 26, we'll say, and then the UK is 28. So the BRICs is already outnumbering um, the, the main four here. Now let's go back to the comparison here. So if we add together United States at 16.75 with Japan, that gets us to uh, 23, and Germany gets us to say 29, France brings us to 33, UK brings us to 37. So that's the weight of them. We could throw in Italy here, put it at about 40. Now let's do China at four, Russia at two, we've got uh, about six there, and India gives us about eight, and then Brazil gives, we'll say 10. So four times the size. We've got four times the amount of voting rights in the IMF for the US, Britain, Japan, Germany, US, EU, and, and the UK, and yet, we've got four times, uh, or, or I mean, uh, a slightly larger um, GDP uh, pr for purchasing power parity. Uh, with China on top, India in third, Russia in fifth, and Brazil in seventh. Now that is very interesting. Obviously this thing is completely skewed against the BRICS, and I think that's probably the reason why we're seeing them go around the IMF and form their own. Now, the other thing that's very interesting about this is that, as I pointed out, the funding for the IMF is uh, a similar breakdown to the voting rights of the IMF. And so look at the top funders of the IMF. Now, there's an issue I'm not gonna cover it here about the Congress not funding it. But uh, if you look at the top power holders in the IMF, the US, Japan, 
Germany, France, and the UK. These are all the bankrupt countries of the West. These are the ones the IMF is relying on for their funding based upon their voting power. Whereas ones with uh, reserves in their foreign exchange, it's China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, India, uh, they're not even included. So this is really ridiculous. It's really a joke. You've got people like Jim Rickard saying that uh, SDR is going to be the thing of the future. But by looking at these numbers, it tells me that the SDR is, is just simply dying. And uh, if you want to get a look at what countries are going down, all you have to do is look at the members of the SDR, the currencies that are members of the SDR. These are all the countries that are, and the Euro countries combined. These are all the countries of the world that are collapsing. Is the IMF going to collapse? Well, I don't really think that China wants to be a part of this. I Certainly, if I were in a powerful position in China, I would certainly argue for not being included in the IMF and the SDR. Why would you want to increase your share in a dying organization that's obviously rigged, that is rigged four to one against your interests, whereas you could just continue to accumulate gold um, and uh, then go ahead and launch your currency? So when we go back and look at the Chinese currency, we can see that the, with the dollar strengthening, the Chinese currency is going sideways. And uh, just looked at, looking at the US dollar index, you can see that strength. There's a tremendous number of currencies that are collapsing around the world, but not the Chinese currency. The Chinese currency is trading free market within the band. It's holding its own against the US dollar. So it's my opinion that China doesn't, I don't think China really wants to be a member of, of the SDR. I think that they probably will be glad when this window passes, they're not included, and they can just continue to accumulate gold. Ultimately, the BRICS will probably just replace or have a competitor for the IMF and the World Bank, the BRICS Bank, and uh, the stuff that Jim Woolley's always talking about. And of course, if you think about it, who has the money to fund it? Well, China, India, Russia, Brazil's hurting right now, but those are the strong economies. Those are the growing economies, uh, whereas the main members of the IMF, these are the shrinking economies. So it seems to me that the Chinese probably want to just go ahead and continue with what they're doing and uh, just let the IMF go their own way. And uh, so we want to look at a chart, of course, of silver in the Chinese currency, but unfortunately we can't do that. Uh, we can look at silver in the Japanese yen. We can look at it, look at it in a lot of currencies and uh, gold as well. And if you look at uh, silver in some other currencies, uh, things aren't quite as bad. Let's look at silver, for example, in the Canadian dollar. The Canadian dollar is getting weaker against the U.S. dollar. Uh, uh, some other currencies that are getting weaker. Of course, uh, the stuff going on in Greece, the stuff going on in Brazil, the stuff going on in Venezuela. I wish we had the charts to show you those, but uh, with a lot of these currencies weakening, uh, let's let's see if we can pull up silver in the Australian dollar. That has taken a hit uh, recently, and uh, fortunately, we don't have. Doesn't look like we have the long term time frame. So in the Australian dollar, you can see that silver is still weak, but it is turning up here and uh, it's nowhere near new lows. That's happening across the world. It's just not happening in US dollars. But I think that uh, when the US and Britain and Europe uh, go down, I think it's gonna happen, go down with the IMF and replaced by uh, a better funded um, World Bank and IMF from the East, uh, then that's where we're finally going to see silver prices uh, explode in dollar terms. And we'll talk to you next time.